keep the time, I always take a minute before to introduce our next speaker, who is Jennifer Lackey. Jennifer is the Winnell Elizabeth Jones Professor of Philosophy at North, uh, Northwestern University. She works in various uh, branches of epistemology, uh, social epistemology, applied epistemology, legal epistemology, and also in philosophy of language, ethics, and uh, feminist philosophy. And Jennifer's program, at least in the last <laughs> years, focuses on the epistemology of groups. And so I uh, all, uh, encourage you all to check out her new book, uh, The Epistemology of Groups, um, which just came out, UP, which is focusing on group lies, group justified belief, group assertion, and so much more. And Jennifer also writes about disagreement, the epistemology of punishment, academic freedom, epistemology of sexual consent, um, and testimonial injustice. And um, Jennifer also teaches uh, philosophy at Statesville uh, Correctional Center in Illinois, and she's been the driving force in establishing a statewide prison education system. Um, and, and, and they got an initiative uh, which got a huge grant to promote prison uh, education system uh, at with Northwestern. So this is really cool. So Jennifer, it's a great honor to have you with us today. And uh, the title of your talk is Extracted Testimony and the United States Criminal Legal System. So, um, or is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to start off by saying my, my screen is actually quite small. So um, if you if anyone has a comment or question while I'm giving the talk, I won't be able to see you. So feel free to unmute yourself and just, um, you know, speak so that I can hear you because um, just the way that my screen is set up, I can't, um, I won't be able to see you while I'm using my slides. Um, so, uh, as I said, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And, and what I um, hope to, um, what I plan to talk to you about today is, um, you know, talking about oppressive speech. And um, I want to take kind of a, a deep dive um, into oppressive speech uh, uh, in the United States criminal legal system. And um, this is part of a bigger book project. So I have chapters on plea deals, and I have a chapter on eyewitness testimony. And I was originally planning to talk about multiple phenomena today, um, but ultimately um, felt like just given the, the, the time constraints that I would focus on um, the way that um, confession evidence is extracted from people um, through um, interrogation tactics that are uh, coercive, manipulative, and deceptive. And then the um, very dominant epistemological role that that plays in criminal proceedings in the US. Um, I don't mean to suggest that this doesn't happen anywhere else. It's just that my special, my area of expertise is in the U.S. criminal legal system. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I know of plenty of stories of um, confession evidence being extracted in similar ways. Um, you know, kind of more globally. Um, and so I'm going to just take a, a, a look at. I'm going to examine um, how confession evidence functions this way. And, um, but like I said, I think that the phenomenon that I'm ad identifying through a close analysis of confession evidence is generalizable. And in fact, in, uh, a, like I said, a big project, I, I look at um, additional um, areas where I think we can see this. So um, confession evidence have, have, you know, confessions have long been considered the gold standard in evidence. I mean, even historically, um, when you look, um, it's, you know, kind of, especially when you look at the history of torture and how torture was related to confessions, um, it was always kind of regarded as, you know, the queen of proof. And here we have, um, you, you know, kind of the U.S. Supreme Court recognizing that confession evidence is perhaps the most powerful evidence built admissible in court. So powerful, in fact, that the introduction of a confession makes the other aspects of a trial in court perfluous and the real trial for all practical purposes occurs when the confession is obtained. But there's an immediate problem that arises, you know, for this kind of so-called gold standard of evidence when the prevalence of false confessions is taken into account. And so for the purpose of what we're looking at, we're just going to understand a false confession as an admission to a criminal act that's usually accompanied by a narrative of how and why the crime occurred that the confessor didn't commit. So since 1989, there have been 367 post-conviction DNA exonerations in the United States, and 28% of these involved false confessions. And most of the time, I think that when people kind of think just from the armchair about when they themselves 
um, might, you know, kind of could, could conceive of themselves falsely confessing. They tend to think of very minor infractions, you know, well, maybe I would admit to something very minor, but in fact, confessions involve everything from minor infractions to very detailed accounts of violent crimes. And in fact, in the largest sample ever studied, um, this Drizzen and Leo um, um, study, um, where they looked at 125 cases of proven false confessions between 1971 and 2002 in the US, 81% occurred in murder cases, um, and that was followed by rape and arson. So what I want to look at today is how false confess confessions that are extracted through coercive, manipulative, and deceptive interrogation techniques pose a unique and compelling challenge to the current conceptual tools that are used to understand, uh, you know, kind of a widely discussed phenomenon in um, contemporary philosophy um, of testimonial injustice. So. I, you know, kind of hope, you know, part of the bigger project is to show how philosophy can benefit from like relying quite heavily on empirical work in the social sciences and in criminal law, but also how social sciences and criminal law can benefit from the normative framework that's provided by the philosophical concept of testimonial injustice. So I think that there's um, really kind of a mutually, um, you know, um, uh, beneficial role here. So false, um, there are many factors contribute to people falsely confessing to cr crimes that they didn't conf confess, uh, to, to, that they didn't commit. And these are usually divided up into um, what's called situational factors and um, dispositional factors. So situational factors can include a multitude of, of things. Um, I'm gonna be focusing on just some of the most dominant ones. So first is the length of the interrogation. Uh, it's advised that single interrogation sessions not exceed four hours if we're kind of truth directed. But in that largest sample that was looked at um, where they were recording um, proven false confessions, 34% lasted six to 12 hours, 39% lasted 12 to 24 hours, and the mean was 16.3 hours. And it's not uncommon to actually hear of, you know, kind of ver these very lengthy interrogation sessions um, going on for multiple days, sometimes even weeks. Um, isolation and uh, sleep deprivation have also been shown to be connected. So, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, isolation, you know, constitutes a form of deprivation that can heighten a, a person's distress and incentive to remove himself or herself from the situation. And sleep deprivation, as I think we all know, um, strongly impairs human functioning. Um, I think from an epistemological point of view, one of the most interesting is the presentation of false evidence. So it's permissible in the United States for police to just outright lie to suspects. So they can say we have your DNA evidence or, um, you know, kind of some, someone else pointed the finger at you or, you know, kind of your, you know, kind of the suspect in the next room said he saw you there. And so when involvement in criminal activity is denied, um, you know, kind of interrogators can present this, you know, kind of purportedly decisive evidence of guilt, um, which can kind of lead to all sorts of um, psychological responses. So I think this is just a really interesting case. In 1989, Marty Tankliff was accused at the age of 17 of murdering his parents. Despite the complete absence of evidence against him, he vehemently denied the charges for several hours until his interrogator told him that his hair was found within his mother's grasp that a humidity test indicated he had showered and so the presence of only one spot of that explains the the presence of only one spot of blood on his shoulder and that his hospitalized father had emerged from his coma to say that marty was his assailant all of this was untrue in fact his father never regained consciousness and died shortly thereafter so following these lies, he became disoriented and confessed, but he immediately recanted. Nevertheless, solely on the basis of that confession, he was convicted only to have his conviction vacated and the charges dismissed 19 years later. Um, he now is an attorney who actually, um, you know, talks, you know, at great, you know, widely and publicly about um, false confessions and self-report studies also confirm this. People who have falsely confessed will say um, that they just felt weighed down by the the just the, the quantity or the quality of the evidence that they said um, that they were told was was against them. Um, and then there are maximization and minimization techniques. Maximization is a hard sell approach that tell, you know, involves the interrogator trying to scare or intimidate witnesses, offering false claims, as we saw about the evidence, exaggerating the seriousness of not cooperating. Um, just in, in my work and in, in, um, in, on this 
topic and in, in prison education, I've met a number of people who have falsely confessed. And, you know, um, you know, one of my friends, um, you know, was told that, you know, he would be eligible for the death penalty when in fact he wasn't. So just exaggerating the seriousness of the consequences of not cooperating um, is, a, is, a, is a common technique. Minimization is, is a soft sell approach where, you um, the interrogator tries to offer sympathy or face saving excuses, even moral justification. I would have done the same thing. I understand where you're coming from. And then there are dispositional factors, which I'll go through quite quickly. Um, juvenile status and mental impairment. So um, in the of the first 200 DNA exonerations in the US, 35% of those false confess confessors were 18 years or younger and or had a developmental disability. And it's pretty easy to see the factors at work here. Impairments in you know, incompetence, such as the ability to assist in one's own defense or an inability to grasp legal terms, such as Miranda rights. Um, interestingly, innocence often can contribute to false confessions. So people who are innocent will might waive their Miranda rights to silence and to counsel, be super um, forthcoming and willing to chat with police. And then minor inconsistencies that, you know, kind of would be found in any one of our testimony if we sat and talked about, you know, kind of what we did, you know, two weeks ago um, are used to um, call into question their credibility. And then when a suspect confesses, this often leads the police to regard the case is closed. Um, and so um, confession evidence is, is, is really interesting in that it's not like many other pieces of evidence, like a fingerprint or a, um, a, a weapon, um, because those are taken as pieces of evidence to build a case, whereas oftentimes when a suspect confesses, the case is closed. This is regard, and then they start building the case for the prosecution. Um, and so this leads to tunnel vision and to in, um, the likelihood of overlooking exculpatory evidence. Um, I, I'm just going to briefly talk about testimonial injustice. I think that this is a phenomenon, that, uh, you know, a concept that's familiar to many. Um, the standard conception of testimonial injustice um, is, um, uh, this is kind of found in, uh, you know, originally in the work of uh, Miranda Fricker, um, that it involves getting less cre credibility than the evidence says a testifier ought to get. And this is, um, you know, kind of, you know, the result of some sort of bias or prejudice that targets the speaker's social identity. Um, so uh, Fricker is particularly interested in prejudices that track a subject through different dimensions of social activity, economic, educational, professional, and so on. Um, and it's in those cases, it's systematic. And the type that tends to track people in this way is related to social identity, such as racial and gender identity. And according to Fricker, um, testimonial injustice wrongs someone in capacity as a knower. So, um, you know, Fricker is pretty clear that um, she thinks only credibility deficits lead to testimonial injustice. Um, just given the time constraints, I'm not going to go into all of her reasoning here, but it tends to um, kind of be grounded in an idea um, that um, credibility is um, not a finite good in the way that we might think, like, if I give more to someone else, then I'm giving less to someone else. Credibility isn't like that. And so um, she thinks that giving more credibility to someone might result in some downstream harms. Maybe they'll become immodest, arrogant, and so on. Um, but it doesn't wrong someone in and of itself in their capacity um, as a knower. And um, I think that kind of I'm going to be looking at confession evidence today, but I actually think, like I said, that the phenomenon is quite generalizable um, and, and, and extremely widespread in the criminal legal system. Um, so I actually think that there is, I think, an interestingly different form of, of, of testimonial injustice, what I end up calling agential testimonial injustice, that crucially, I think, not in some sort of kind of, kind of minor um, counterexample sort of way, um, but um, crucially involves uh, an excess of credibility. Um, so I'm going to be looking at um, how when the testimony of a confessing um, is privileged over a canting self because of prejudice, whether this is racial or otherwise, this can result in a unique kind of testimonial injustice that's to a credibility excess. Um, I should just note that I actually don't think that in terms of the concept of agential testimonial injustice, um, the prejudice actually need not play a special role is not a um, a uh, a necessary feature of it, but I think that it can it can it can exacerbate it, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more. So 
So I think we can um, kind of see this um, focusing on some features of false confessions. So I'm going to try to show you how confession evidence has three different, um, at least three different um, epistemological consequences. It swamps other evidence, it distorts other evidence, and it's resistant to counter evidence. And um, this is going to be important because I think that these showing this um, is the basis for concluding that um, confession evidence is given more credibility than it should, right? An excess of credibility, an unwarranted excess of credibility is problematic when it's more credibility than, than, than the speaker ought to be given. And so um, by virtue of showing that it has these three epistemological consequences, that's going to be the basis for that. So um, confession evidence, you know, kind of um, often trumps even DNA evidence. Um, so this is just, I think, a really powerful case where we see this. So um, Juan Rivera was um, convicted of the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl in Waukegan, Illinois, um, on the basis of his confession, even after DNA testing of semen at the scene excluded him. And the state's theory of why DNA belonging to someone other than Juan Rivera was found in the victim was that um, they had said that the that the young girl had had prior consensual sex with an unknown male, after which time Rivera raped her, failed to ejaculate, and then killed her. Um, and this sort of move, when there is DNA evidence that conflicts with um, confession evidence that the prosecution has used to ground a conviction, um, is so widespread that it... Um, has, has a name actually, it's called the um, unindicted co-ejaculator. So it's this, it's a move that people make to say, um, actually, no, this person really is still guilty. Or another move that you see prosecutors made to try to explain away the DNA evidence so that they don't have to, you know, kind of um, exonerate someone um, is to say um, that maybe they were, they were um, conspiring together. Um, because of trial errors and post-conviction DNA testing, Rivera ended up actually having three separate jury trials, and he was found guilty and sentenced to live in prison on all three occasions. So it might be easy to say, oh, well, there was just one jury that, you know, kind of just was really, you know, kind of in the grips of, of, of the power of that confession, but actually three separate jury trials um, found him guilty on the basis of that confession. And the fact that he was convicted of the child's murder shows that the state's outrageous theory was regarded as more credible than the possibility that he confessed to a crime that he didn't commit. Um, in 2012, the Center on Wrongful Convictions actually here at Northwestern um, took on his case um, and um, it was ruled that the, his conviction was unjustified and couldn't stand. And so the uh, state dismissed all charges, but he had already served 20 years in prison. And um, this is just one case, but I mean, um, you know, in, in some of in my written work, I, I discuss and show, you know, kind of how, how we see this, you know, kind of repeatedly. And the most plausible explanation for these types of cases, I want to suggest, is that the false confession in question is receiving a massive unwarranted access of credibility. So the totality of the evidence against confessions is often substantial, while the evidence in their favor is remarkably thin. So just thinking back to kind of um, some of the features that we looked at, the um, situational and dispositional features that have been shown to increase the likelihood of false confessions. Um, you know, we see, um, you know, kind of we look at like kind of the totality of the evidence in this situation, um, there's absolutely no um, kind of adequate epistemological foundation for, um, for, for grounding his conviction. So um, the evidence in favor of his innocence wasn't only the DNA that excluded him, he was also a 19 year old former special education student. He had been questioned by detectives for four days um, and he had denied steadfastly any knowledge of the crime um, for those four days. But around midnight on the fourth day after the interrogators became really accusatory, and there's also like reports that they had hogtied him. And I mean, you know, kind of this had been going on for days. Um, he broke down and purportedly nodded when he was asked if he had raped and killed the, the 11 year old child. Um, the interrogation then continued until 3 a.m. when investigators left to type a confession for him to sign. Minutes later, jail personnel saw him beating his head against the wall of his cell in what was later termed a psychotic episode. And this was a psychiatric nurse who had actually seen him doing this and, and, and um, you know, 
called it a psych psychotic episode. But nevertheless, within a few hours, he signed the typed confession that the interrogators had, had prepared. And the narrative that he had provided was so riddled with incorrect and implausible information that then Lake County State's attorney um, instructed in investigators to resume the interrogation to clear up the inconsistencies. Um, and despite his obvious fragile mental condition, the interrogators resumed um, the interrogation and it resulted in a second signed confession that contained a much more plausible account of the crime. Um, and so um, I think another thing that's kind of really epistemologically fascinating to note here, um, just thinking about <clears throat> this a credibility excess, right? This massive amount of credibility that I'm question of it adds, is noting that a confessing itself, I mean, case after case after case, I mean, I've looked at hundreds of cases of false confessions and the confessing self will often report guilt only once, right? Under conditions of coercion, manipulation, you know, kind of sleep deprivation and so on. And then they'll recant, you know, hundreds, thousands of times over a period of years, sometimes decades. And, um, Yet that one confession, you know, that one kind of confession um, is taken to be more weighty than literally tens of thousands of other instances of testimony denying it. Um, so we see that confession evidence swamps other evidence. Um, it's regarded as virtually definitive evidence of guilt. We see this about, you know, in the case of like how in, um, investigations are, are virtually closed after a confession. Uh, it distorts other evidence. So outrageous theories of the prosecution are taken to be more plausible than the possibility of a false confession. And it's resistant to counter evidence, exculpatory evidence, inconsistency, like DNA evidence, inconsistencies and in confessions, evidence of the unreliability of the witness are all dismissed. Um, so I, I want to look at this phenomenon of um, extracted testimony. So um, we can understand extracted testimony as testimony that has been obtained in a way that undermines or bypasses agency. And I think that there are three standard ways in which testimony is extracted. I don't mean for this to be exhaustive, but I think that when we look at a lot of the interrogation techniques that are used in the criminal legal system, um, the three ways in which I think um, agency is undermined or bypassed, and I'm going to specifically be interested in epistemic agency um, is through coercion, manipulation, and deception. So very, very, very quickly, I'm going to try to just run through this. Um, at a very high level of generality, there are two ways to influence a person's decision making. You can change the options available, which we can call the decision space, or we can change how the person understands those options, which would be the internal decision making process. So like rational pers persuasion um, can operate at either place but the persuader appeals to the person's capacity for rational deliberation and choice. If I'm trying to convince you um, of the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine, um, if I give you kind of reasons and evidence and you come to believe that on the basis, you come to change your mind, that's a paradigmatic case of my going through your, you know, kind of your, your capacity for rational deliberation and choice and persuading you. Um, in contrast, manipulation, we can say bypasses or circumvents epistemic agency. I, there are complications to this. And if you're really interested in it, we can talk about it during the Q&A. But just for our purposes, I'm going to be presenting this, you know, kind of very, I think, tidy notion of manipulation. So I'm going to be understanding manipulation as just bypassing or circumventing epistemic agency. And I think in this sense, it can be understood as a rational influence. So here are just some kind of um, you know, representative um, characterizations of manipulation. It's the hidden influence, the covert subversion of another person's decision-making power. Um, they say it's subtle and sneaky. And what is distinctive about it is that it undermines our sense of authorship over our own decisions. Um, another one person manipulates another when he deceptively influences him, causing the other to act contrary to his putative will, or in order for A to manipulate B, B, there, B either has no knowledge of or does not understand the ways in which A affects his choices. Sorry, it looks like that the last one got cut off. Um, I'm going to understand, um, I actually argue in, in you know, elsewhere that I I don't think that manipulation has to be covert in the way that, um, or hidden or sneaky or subtle in the way that a lot of these authors say. Um, so I'm just gonna understand manipulation as the intentional, irrational influence 
um, that someone can have over another. So the circumvention of another person's rational decision-making power for the manipulator's desired end. We can understand deception um, as being um, a broader category than deceiving. So to deceive is roughly to aim to bring about a false belief in another person. Um, but while the category of deception subsumes deceiving, it's a broader phenomenon, including, for instance, concealing information. So concealing information is to do things to hide information from someone, to prevent someone from discovering it. Um, and so concealing information constitutes deception or attempted deception. And so this form of deception is obviously pretty widespread. Um, lots of times interrogators um, conceal or hide um, exculpatory information um, or evidence from um, the suspect that they're interrogating. And so um, this form of actually this broader notion of deception, both where I'm aiming to bring about a false belief in a person and where um, I'm concealing information is, is very widespread. So both manipulation and deception can target um, ways of influencing a speaker's decision making, this decision space and the internal decision making process. So stores can manipulate the options available to you by, for instance, having only sugary drinks, drinks available at checkout lines, or they can manipulate the way in which you understand these options by having only sugary drinks be eye level or be presented in a particularly attractive way. And you can be deceived by being told that your only options are to purchase the deluxe internet package or none at all, when in fact there are lots of options. Or you can be deceived with respect to how you see your options by being shown the incredible internet speed using a server that's not actually the companies in question. Okay, so manipulation and deception can, can operate at both levels. But coercion is actually said to be different in that it precisely targets the decision space or the available options. So here's just some characteristic, um, you know, kind of um, uh, representative characterizations. It's to coerce another person is to offer irresistible incentives or eliminating all of the acceptable alternatives. So while coercion robs someone of a choice, it does not affect that person's ability to engage in rational decision making. I mean, typically, I mean, this is all kind of complicated when you look at actual on the ground cases, but I just wanted to get um, the notions of manipulation, deception, uh, deception and coercion on the table. So um, what I want to suggest is by looking at kind of confessions in this deep way that we, 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 we do, or that we did, and that I do, I think, in, in, in more detail in, in my written work, um, the state is saying that the reality described by the confessor in cases of false confessions, one that is reported, it's extracted, right? It's reported only through coercion, manipulation, and deception. I mean, keep in mind, when they're not under these influences, um, the suspects deny any involvement. By virtue of the state saying that that reality represents the, the, the confessor's truest states, the confessor's status as a knower is reduced to what she reports only under conditions devoid of or with diminished epistemic agency. And I think there's a really powerful instructive parallel. In ancient Athens, enslaved persons um, were allowed to testify in judicial proceedings only under torture. So they were not allowed to provide, you know, kind of actual testimony unless they were being tortured. Um, and so they were regarded as credible only when their testimony was, was extracted through interrogation techniques that clearly undermined their epistemic agency. And I want to suggest that I think something actually quite similar is happening in our current criminal legal system. So I want to characterize agential testimonial justice as um, at taking place, speak as the victim of this when testimony that has been extracted, so extracted testimony is testimony that bypasses epistemic agency, either through coercion, um, manipulation, or deception. Um, and so epistemic agency is undermined or bypassed. And then it's given this massive unwarranted credibility excess. So it has two components, extraction and excess. Okay. And um, the, re the first wrong of kind of wrong um, that I think is involved is um, involves the X of credibility given to the extracted testimony. So here I want to suggest that one epistemically wronged by virtue of being regarded as a testifier, a giver of knowledge, a member of the epistemic community, only when one's testimony is extracted and is thus the product of a process that subverts one's epistemic agency. So it's only when you are not exercising your agential capacities, your, epi you know, your epistemic agential capacity, 
that you are um, a giver of knowledge, that you're kind of a legitimate member of the epistemic community. And the second kind of epistemic wrong um, in, in, involved in, in this phenomenon results from the very act of extracting the testimony from a speaker in a way that subverts her epistemic agency. So the very act of not going through someone's agency, but going either around it. Um, in, in some of my written work, I also talk about cases where it's actually exploited. So you do go through it. it. Um, so all of these different ways uh, of not actually just going kind of properly going through epistemic agency that also is involves um, is, is, is the second what I call the second kind of epistemic wrong involved in this phenomenon. Um, and so um, in other work, I talk about how prejudice and bias can exacerbate this, but I think that we can see that the extract. So I mean, for, for instance, um, kind of racism can certainly and, and, and does, I mean, and, and I, I discussed this, um, you know, kind of the actual um, phenomenon and the likelihood uh, in my written work, um, you know, racism can certainly lead to extraction um, and to the li greater likelihood of having testimony be extracted. And, you know, kind of all sorts of stereotypes about criminality um, can lead to, can, can exacerbate the excess of credibility given. So of course, we're going to believe you when you, uh, confess to a violent crime, because we have all of these stereotypes about criminality. So those can certainly be operative and can play a very, very harmful role, but they're not necessary features of the phenomenon of agential testimonial injustice, unlike the phenomenon of testimonial injustice, where the bias or prejudice is in many respects doing the normative work. Um, so, um, one question that we might have, I mean, I only have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to go through this really quickly is why confessing selves, um, are given an, a credibility access in the first place. Um, and we might wonder, like, you know, kind of, we, we might note how crucial it is to address this question because convictions based largely on false confessions can't be explained simply by pointing to deficits. Like, we can't just say, oh, the recantations are given this massive credibility deficit. That's really what's doing the work because it's the confession that's grounding the conviction. So calling the recanter a liar isn't enough for a conviction. You also have to say that the confessor is a truth teller. And I think that there are a lot of factors, um, psychological factors. It's difficult to imagine ourselves confessing to something we didn't do, especially when it involves violent, you know, kind of a violent crime. And especially when it involves, for instance, in the case of Marty Tancliffe, murdering his own parents. Um, the problem with this is that there's just ample psychological research showing otherwise. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but it's actually extremely easy to, to, um, to get people to falsely confess, um, especially, for instance, think back to um, the presentation of false evidence. False confessions also affect the perceptions of others. Um, there's like studies that show that when you tell someone someone falsely confessed it, they will actually change um, their, their kind of, for instance, eyewitness accounts or alibi um, you know, accounts. And so this data shows that false confessions beget additional misleading evidence um, downstream. Um, also, like I mentioned, racial prejudice or bias, 85% of juvenile exonerees who falsely confessed are African-American. And then practical interests um, in many cases, for instance, especially when you're looking at something like the United States criminal legal system, the practical interests of the, of the, prosecute, of the prosecution, for instance, um, often can lead to tunnel vision, of refuse to admit that they're wrong. Uh, this is just a very well-known case and um, um, in Chicago, there's so many cases in Chicago. This was um, the Dixmore Five, where DNA evidence ruled out five defendants who had falsely confessed to the rape and murder of a 14-year-old girl. And after ser serving a total of 95 years behind bars, all five of them were exonerated in 2011, 2011. And the Illinois State Police settled in 2013 a civil rights case brought on their behalf for a record $40 million. And moreover, the semen that was found inside the 14-year-old matched Willie Randolph who was a convicted rapist with 39 arrests. And yet, despite all of this, right, even like the $40 million settlement, they're all ex exonerated. Um, there was a 2000, a very notorious now 2015 interview 
60 minutes interview with um, then state's attorney Anita Alvarez. And when she was asked about this case, she said um, she refused to admit that they were actually wrongfully convicted and said that it was actually still possible that the five defendants had raped and murdered the girl and that Randolph wandered past the field where her body was and committed an act of necrophilia. Um, and I, I just note this to kind of again point out um, the overwhelming of, you know, kind of role that the confession plays in the criminal legal system and how these outrageous theories are, are proposed to, um, to hold on to them. So um, false confessions, I think, um, provide an example of a new agential form of testimonial injustice, which involves um, ex excess credibility given to a confessing self in conditions that undermine epistemic agency, in other words, in cases where the testimony has been extracted. And in such cases, the state is quite straightforwardly saying to its citizens, you are worthy of being believed only when we bypass your epistemic agency and extract information from you through coercive or manipulative or deceptive methods. That this is a particularly pernicious form of testimonial injustice carried out by institutions in which we place our trust cries out, I think, for a radical change in the epistemic lens through which we view confessions in the criminal legal system. Thanks. Thank you so much. Jennifer, that was so rich and so super interesting and <laughs> chilling at the same time. Um, so uh, that's really, really wonderful. So I see Ron already um, having a hand raised. So please go ahead. And uh, we, yeah, All right. we wait. Oh, um, thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, what a great great topic and what a great treatment of it. I had um, one quick comment and then um, I wanted to press you on a question to see what you think. The comment was, um, uh, I don't know if you know work by Kate Mann. She um, has some work where she talks about um, women who accuse their, uh, usually their romantic partners or their spouses of, of violence or sexual violence, and then later recant. An example is uh, Ivana Trump, the former, you know, wife of our former president. Um, and I just thought, uh, was thinking about those cases as kind of different, a, a different case where you have this flip testimony. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't look exactly like the ones that you're talking about. Uh, and I think it would be an interesting test case when you think about um, changing testimony over time to look at different kinds of cases. Uh, so I just mentioned that as a comment. The thing I wanted to press you on was this issue about, um, uh, about extraction. So one thing about it, uh, about, and I wanna think about the manipulation case because I think that's the strongest case for the, the way I wanna press you. Um, which is, uh, it doesn't seem like all cases of manipulation are morally wrong um, in general. It doesn't seem like it's morally wrong for me um, to, uh, you know, enhance my uh, Zoom filter so that people will like me more, for example, even though that probably appeals to subrational processes in people. Um, and it, it also does, it seems especially not wrong um, in the case where uh, people are interrogating someone, for example, when we, it, it, uh, if imagine that we have a, a guilty criminal and the questioner um, befriends the criminal and expresses sympathy for the criminal, and that's it, that's the limit of the manipulation. But the interrogator, you know, has no genuine interest in friendship with the criminal. It really is a kind of manipulation, um, this expression of, of sympathy and fellow feeling, and they, uh, they get a true confession. Uh, it doesn't seem like um, all cases of manipulation are morally wrong in general, and then it seems like, especially in some criminal cases, some, um, some, some kinds of extraction uh, that bypass agency don't seem especially morally problematic, but maybe you disagree. And I just like to know what you think about that kind of case. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's a, a, a really good point to press. And um, I mean, 
I, um, I think manipulation is like a rabbit's hole that like my book could actually morph into a whole book on manipulation. And I'm really trying to prevent that from happening because my book's not on manipulation, you know? So, so like I have struggled a lot with this literature because there's a lot of it. And, um, you know, like a lot of it, for instance, just assumes this covert nature of manipulation. And I just don't think manipulation has to be covert in that sort of way. I think we can manipulate. I mean, I use an example where I I'm very confident my children were manipulating me and they were doing it like why out in the open. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it has to be covert. Um, I, so I think there's like choice points in the manipulation in understanding manipulation. One is that, and then the other is, um, like this goodness, badness that I think you're pointing to. And like one of the things that I, um, I, I haven't seen, and there's a lot, you know, a lot of people here. So like, if you know of literature on this, like point, point, you know, please put it in the chat. But like one thing that I haven't really seen a discussion of in the manipulation literature is that like a lot of the very same um, kind of the, the very same like mechanism that we see to describe manipulation happens in like coaching relationships, mentoring relationships, parenting relationships, like putting the, 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 the Clementines at eye level in my house and not putting the Reese's peanut butter cups at eye level, right? Like. And so in some ways I'm manipulating my children in the same way that the store is manipulating me, right? And so, um, you know, we clearly want an account of manipulation that, well, I mean, there are two ways we're, we're all, you know, we all know this, right? You either say that, yes, that is manipulation, but not all manipulation is bad. Or you say that that's not manipulation and you come up with a way to kind of distinguish that within your framework. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't have a horse in that race yet. Do you know what I mean? I have haven't kind of decided whether I'm going to go on the side of all manipulation is bad, um, but that that's not manipulation, or there's just some there's just good manipulation. Um, so I, I, I'm really sympathetic um, with your general point that like there's I mean even like kind of very paradigmatic cases of manipulation just are not all bad, right? Um, and so. I have to, in, in, in my account, I mean, like right now I'm looking at like paradigmatic cases where it's clear that the epistemic agency is bypassed or subverted in a way that is problematic. Um, and so once I work out all of the details of which way I'm going to go on the manipulation front, I'm going to have to apply that, you know, to, to the phenomena themselves. And I don't know if it's going to be a degree thing or a kind thing, you know, but um, I guess I just want to say like, I totally agree with you with respect to the general point. And it's something that I've actually thought a lot about, especially in the coaching, mentoring, parenting context. Um, the other thing about um, the recantations of like, um, like I've, I've looked at a lot of recantations of like uh, reports of sexual violence. Um, and there's that like, maybe some have like read that long form article, Unbelievable, or seen the, the docu-series Unbelievable. And it's really a, like a classic case of like the flip, right? So um, I in, in my chapter on eyewitness testimony, I look at how um, eyewitness identifications, even when they're extracted through massive manipulative techniques, like lineup techniques that are super manipulative, manipulative, manipulative and interrogation techniques, um, and then they recant. I mean, like literally you've got court decision after court decision just saying recantations are inherently unreliable. I mean, it's oh. just kind of outrageous. Like why? These are like court cases just saying, just flat out saying these are inherently unreliable instances of testimony. So the eyewitness identifications are given this massive excess of credibility. Recantations are just dismissed. With the reports of sexual violence, like that unbelievable case, it's the absolute reverse, right? She was in fact, raped. She testified to it. She recanted. And then they're like, oh, the recantation is true. Of course she lied about sexual violence, right? And so then that was given this massive excess of credibility. So when you look at the criminal legal system, there is not consistency, right? What does it track? Probably state power, right? I mean, ultimately, what does it track? These, these, the, the distribution of excesses and deficits. It probably ultimately just tracks state power. Um, but anyway, I, I agree with you. I think that there's like some really interesting stuff there on um, testimony, testimony about sexual violence and the recantations of those reports. Just um, one quick thing about the manipulation thing. I think an, a standard strategy is to say something like 
the manipulation's okay if the agent would agree to it or should agree to it or it was in the agent's interest or all these kinds of things. But in the case of the guilty criminal, what's in their interest is to keep their mouth shut. And so it would always be wrong to befriend them, I think, on that kind of story. Anyway, I'll leave that for you to work out, but thank you very much. That's great. Um, next question from Sally and then Catherine. Thank you, Jennifer. Great to see you. A wonderful talk. So I, in the, in the, in the manipulation that are derived from, I haven't studied it closely, but I've been thinking a little about manipulation. I think it's really complicated, as you point out. One of the things that I, I think I get caught up in is when you're talking about the irrational, whether we're talking about practical rationality or epistemic rationality, and whether we're, we're manipulating the practical options or the epistemic options, so to speak. Yeah. And those seem to me really different. So when, when someone is offered a plea deal and they say, look, if you confess to this, then you, we won't charge you with that or something like this. And there's a, there's a kind of manipulation there because the options are being manipulated, but the person is presumably in a position to use practical rationality to, to make a decision about that. But their decision, I think, is still manipulated, um, but it's yes. manipulated not epistemically, but it's manipulated pragmatically or practically. But then there are other cases where you were talking about when um, people are, are told falsehoods, well, this is a kind of deception too, but they're manipulated into confessing by being told that they have evidence that you know puts them at the scene or whatever like that. Um, and then there's a kind of, I don't know, it seems to me more epistemic than practical what we're talking about, the irrationality of it. I'm actually not sure it's irrational either because it seems to me, person is taking evidence and trying to draw some conclusions. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I think that we don't always have uh, first person access, uh, privileged access to what we've done. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we all do things that we don't remember or we can't. And you might think, oh, how could you forget killing someone? But, but it's tricky if someone provides you compelling evidence that you did something, um, it's not completely irrational to, to um, believe them and to go ahead and say, okay, I guess you're right. I don't remember it, but I guess you're right. And so it doesn't seem to me quite epistemically irrational either, I'm, and I, but it does seem manipulative. Mm. So I'm, I'm a little confused here about the pragmatic and the epistemic and what it is that is at issue. I'm sorry if that was confusing, I'm just, I'm just in the in the murk here. I'm just in the mire. <laughs> so it's not confusing at all. I mean, I think that you're exactly right. Um, and so in the in in my written work, um, I specifically pull out the difference between. Um, so of course it might be. I mean, I'm I, I, right now writing my chapter on plea deals. So I'm totally in the thick of plea deals. And of course it's rational in some ways. Like I, I'm looking at case after case after case of people pleading guilty when they're innocent, right? And it's because they're facing life versus like six years and they've got young children and they're like, they might be a person of color. And even their defense attorney is saying, I don't think we're gonna win this, right? Um, and so of course there's a sense in which it's totally rational, right? To accept that. Um, and so I draw a distinction when I'm talking about manipulation between, um, you know, kind of the, putting practical options on the table that make it practically rational to accept something versus engaging in an evidence, like, an, like an, a, 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 an activity of inquiry where I'm giving you evidence and reasons and support. So I'm really talking about going through epistemic agency at that level of evidence and reasons and you know so on. So like for instance, if we're talking about like an eyewitness identification, talking to you about like, well, did he have a hat on? Did he have a gap between his teeth? Staying at the level of the, you know, kind of the um the the, the identification. So the question whether P. OK, but when I start saying, hey, if you don't pick out the guy I want, which happens all the time, remember, you know, I, I you know, like, remember how, you know, you, you've got kids at home and you've got that kind of case on you. Well, you might lose your kids. 
So in that sense, it might be rational to pick out the suspect that I know they want me to pick out of the lineup, right? But you've shifted the question from a theoretical one to a practical one. And so it's practically rational for me to pick out that suspect so I don't lose my kids. But you are no longer having me exercise my epistemic agency. You're not saying things like, well, do you remember where you were? Do you remember what he was wearing? Do you remember if you heard this? That's going through my epistemic agency. Now, so, so I, I, I definitely draw that distinction in the book, and I think it's an important one. But I also want to say that there's this further complication in that I don't think all manipulation is a rational and like I... So I give that characterization for the purposes of today because it's simple and tidy, but I actually think that there are cases, even on the epistemic side, even with at the level of the exchanging of reasons where it's rational. And I call those cases, so the irrational ones I call going bypassing or circumventing someone's epistemic agency. And the cases where manipulation is going through the epistemic agency, I call it exploiting the epistemic agency. Um, so um, I don't know, I, I can quickly give you a case. So like, this is an actual case, right? Um, I wanted my kid to come home from a friend's house. And I told her, you need to come home. She had been sleeping over there multiple nights. I was like, you need to get home. And it was multiple hours away. And then she left her laptop there. And I knew what was happening, right? She was thinking, my mom cares about school. She cares that I do well in school. She knows I can't do my work without my laptop. So I'm going to manipulate the options available to her so that the only real choice she has is to choose to let me go back to my friend's house. It, she was exploiting my ration. She was like literally in, like thinking through my rational, re my reasoning process, right? And exploiting that for a desired end. So I don't think it's all irrational. I think I was manipulated. I felt really confident that I was manipulated um, and it went through my epistemic agency. So all of that's just by way of saying it's a really complicated topic and I try to just gloss over all of this when I'm talking about like a phenomenon like false confessions. Great, thank you so much. That was really helpful. <clears throat> that's fascinating, Shane. I think you cut out for a minute. Did my internet, okay. And my internet may not be great. <laughs> yeah, it's unstable. Uh, Catherine? Thanks, this is a great talk. And some of what you just said might be partially responsive to this question, but I imagine that um, to justify the credibility imbalance given to the confessions versus the recantations, uh, it seems like someone might want to say that under any circumstances, it's always irrational to confess if you're innocent, but then it's perfectly rational to recant um, later, uh, especially once you've been convicted. And, and so there might be this sort of reasoning, um, reasoning driving the way we treat these two things. And it seems like you... Obviously, you're pointing out that there's all these conditions that are compromising epistemic agency when someone um, gives a false confession or most of the time. Um, but it seems like you're going to want to say something about like the epistemic agency is insufficient or something, right? Because it's your epistemic agency could be compromised, but still be sufficient for you to tell the truth. So I, I just wonder. Um, how you would respond to that sort of justification and what you wanna say about compromising agency, like is there a threshold under which it's no longer sufficient or, or what you wanna say there? Yeah, good. So, um, so, so I definitely, so, so in order to like be the victim of what I call agential testimonial injustice, you really do need the problem with your epistemic agency. So you need to be coerced, manipulated, or deceived. And then that testimony needs to be given a real access of credibility. So I do think both of those parts are, cr are crucial to, the, to be the victim of agential testimonial injustice. Um, and the reason for that is because I think that um, it really is part of the story that I want to tell that the criminal legal system is saying that people people are like worthy of being believed, right? They're like worthy of like having their testimony kind of be be given like proper proper you know kind of credence only when like we don't actually like listen to them as autonomous you know kind of agents, right? It's only when we're using all of these 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 tactics. Um, 
So I think that there can be cases in which um, agency is um, is is bypassed or or you know or circumvented or something like that. Um, but uh, and where the person is not the victim of test of agential testimonial injustice, um, and it might actually even even just be okay. I mean, I think that Ron was suggesting that in his question too, that like if, if an interrogator is just saying like I might have done the same thing, like I get it, I, I understand, like that might not be enough for us to say that the person was wronged as a test. You know what I mean? That they were that they, they were they were wronged in some sort of way. I mean, there there are different like choice points we can like on this on this question we could say well. They were wronged, but it was so minimal as to not really be that significant. Or we could just say they just weren't wronged at all. Um, and honestly, I just haven't like kind of come down on that because I've really been thinking through like the really classic paradigmatic, you know, kind of cases. Um, I don't know, Catherine, did I answer? I feel like I maybe did not like kind of directly engage. Did you want to follow up? Um, I, I mean, there's a lot to think about there. Um, especially with the, when the agency is sufficient for, for us to believe the confession. Um, and I, I guess just the sort of justification about it always being rational to recant. And that, that point is maybe the one that I'd wanna hear more about, but there's other questions too, so we can move on. Yeah, yeah. no, let me, let, me, let, me, let me talk about that. I mean, so um, I do think that there is this, um, this, this I, you know, kind of um, sort of, uh, like widespread, um, uh, like kind of belief that of course it's it's rational to recant because of course you're going to try to avoid a lengthy prison sentence. It's in your self interest, right? And in many respects, that's I think a, a, like lurking in the background of our the weight that we give to con false to false confessions too, because it's like it's so against your self interest to do this, right? It's so against your self-interest to false to confess to something you didn't do. But the problem is that actually the way that the structure the system is set up, it's actually oftentimes really in your interest to confess, right? It's totally in your interest to confess. And so um, once you see, I think you're right, like just from the armchair, it seems like in your interest to recant, in your interest to not confess. So when you confess, it, we really are going to think it's true. And when you recant, we're going to be suspicious, right? But once you kind of take a step back and look at the way that we have set up the criminal legal system, over 95% of criminal convictions in this country are through plea deals, right? Over 95%. I mean, you know, all the work I'm doing now, people are just calling it like the vanishing trial. Like there's just no longer a, like, 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 you know, people are no longer really able to exercise their constitutional right. And so when you take a step back and you look at just all these mechanisms at work, it actually is massively in your interest to confess, especially if you're a person of color, especially if you're a young African male, you know, kind of African American male, um, you know, because the likelihood of, of the, the so called trial penalty, you know what I mean? I was literally just yesterday morning writing about a case of two co defendants. One took the plea, he was out in six years, the other went to trial, got natural life. Same crime. He was offered a plea deal, but he said, I'm innocent. I'm not going to take it. So when you look at how we incent massively incentivize people to actually say that they're guilty, even when they're not, we have no data on the number of innocent people who have pled guilty because, because Who's going to go look at all those cases? Who's going to dig all those up, right? No one's going to, no, you know, it's also, it's also really hard to actually even get like innocence attorneys to take those cases because once you plead guilty, it's really hard to reverse that. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is like, I totally get that intuition, that confession against your interest, recantation in your interest. But actually, I think it's, we've created such a deeply pernicious system in this country that it's flipped. Do you know what I mean? That's actually just not true anymore. Yeah. And as Ron uh, mentions, it's it's against your long-term interest rather than, um, and not in the short term. So I totally agree with this. And the final question from Alice. So we're running um, up against time, but please go ahead. Um, I'll be quick. I was wondering, I'm sorry if you mentioned this before in your talk and I just missed it because my internet connection hasn't been so good, but 
I have a question about the sort of epistemic position of the interrogator. So I was wondering if um, you would consider them to be like a genuine epistemic inquirer or like maybe something like slightly different because there are things um, like incentive structures for a policeman to convict and maybe there are incentive structures for interrogators to convict as well. Um, I remember I think reading that somewhere. So yeah, I was just wondering like, what do you think the epistemic role or position um, of the um, interrogator is? So I love that question. And I love the way you, you asked it. Like, is the interrogator a genuine inquirer? Um, so I've gotten, like, I think, versions of this question before, but not, I, I like, not the way you put it. I really liked the, putting it in terms of being an inquirer. So one of the things, reasons you might think that this is like a really important question is because if I'm going to be talking about this as an epistemic phenomenon, and it's all just practical, right? Like the interrogator just doesn't, is not even like an inquirer, is not even in the realm of looking at this as evidence, just wants to kind of like, you know, put like slots down for their convictions. Then just doing this work as an epistemologist might be a little bit misguided, right? And so I guess what I want to say is um, I think that there are interrogators who are not inquirers in the way that you suggest, but I also think that there are plenty who are. Um, I think part of the problem, I was at a, a big conference on false confessions a couple of years ago, and it was really interdisciplinary. It had judges, it had prosecutors, it had um, exonerees who had falsely confessed. It had, um, but it also had the people who train police officers in interrogations. And during the conference, he got up and he said, we got really good at extracting confessions. The problem is we did not get good at extracting true confessions. And so what's happened is all of these police officers and interrogators are being trained to believe that this is how you get at the truth. I really do. I mean, I, I think that there's plenty of evidence for thinking that a lot of interrogators keep in mind that a lot of these crimes, some of these violent crimes that they're trying to solve happen in their own communities. Right. They go home. This is their neighborhood. Right. And so to believe that all of these people are just trying to get a conviction, regardless of whether or not the person is guilty or innocent, I think is just not plausible. It's just not plausible to think. Nevertheless, I think that you're, I think, I love your question. I mean, I'm going to think about it a lot. I think more just generally speaking to think about the role of the interrogator and their, their position as an inquirer. I, I really like that way of putting it, but I do think that many of them have to be at least quasi inquirers because I do think that they care about like getting the right person, so to speak, you know, but thank you for that. Wonderful. So are there any questions? Okay. So thank you again, Jennifer. That was, that was fascinating, you. fascinating talk. Thank you everyone for the feedback. <laughs> great, great discussion. One quick point that actually I, I was wondering in terms of distinguishing the and bad sense of manipulation that you started with, uh, with Ron and then Sally, is the role of power a way to sort 